Welcome to another episode of Money for Nothing, the podcast about music and capitalism. I'm Saxon Baird with Sam Backer, as always. Sam, there's some actually some uh, some pretty nice news uh, that we woke up to a couple weeks ago that uh, the United Musicians and Allied Workers got together with Rashid Talib and Jamal Bowman and decided to put forth the Living Wage for Musicians Act. I mean. We don't need to go into it, but the uh, the news cycle in the last you know six months to my entire lifetime has pretty much been uh, horrific. And so I don't know. It was kind of nice waking up and, and reading about this. Uh, this I guess cool news. We call it cool news, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This is this is cool news. It's cool. Yeah, it's an end by members of Congress who are proving their worth in many ways. Yeah, one of what a, a few the 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 few among many uh the few the not, proud not the doing woke. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um so yeah, what's it about? Why don't you I'll let you I'll let you explain what the uh what it's all about. Yeah, so this is exciting. Um and it's uh it's actually part of a of a um a broader wave of legislation that we're not going to get into today, though Saxon, we should probably do at some point an episode about like all of these different Canada recently is either uh, I think passed, but it's trying to pass a bill, France, the EU, all these, uh, Uruguay, all these different go Uruguay. So yeah, there's, there's an interesting, uh, uh, kind of tidal wave, maybe not a tidal wave, uh, tide of legislation, let's call it, um, growing tide, a growing tide of legislation (laughs) as, as I think that in the wake and, 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 you know, in the broader context, it makes a certain amount of sense, right? We're in the wake of major creative industry strikes. We're in, you know, the sense that AI is about to start changing things and, and uh, the tech lash continues. You know, I think there's this long period of time where it felt like there was little or no way that you could roll back the kind of world creating power of these companies. And and, and strangely enough, it's, it's like in the U.S. context, at least it's a little bipartisan, you know, that folks on both the left and the right don't necessarily aren't necessarily buying what some of these companies are selling and not buying the the, the reasons that they're giving um, which even though the, the the reasons on both left and right for kind of thinking critically about these tech companies are very different to me that sh- suggests like a broader like ideological shift right like something deep deep structural is changing that that makes certain kinds of critique possible now that wasn't possible earlier so that's maybe like the the two million foot view more specifically i think that there's been a real in the wake of the the pandemic there's just a sense that um streaming isn't working for folks um and there's been clearly um the uh, yuma um has been really great about bringing together in like kind of focused (laughs) advocacy campaigns and really creating a conversation around this um, and around the, the the problems with streaming, and so yeah, and 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 on the flip side, we know that the the streaming companies themselves have started to change their rules. Check out our recent uh, uh, episode on that. So if they can change the rules, why can't we? Um, exactly. So yeah, so so this is the kind of the basic structure, like what's going on around it. Now this has just been proposed. Um, I think that there's zero percent chance that this bill will pass for a variety of reasons that we're going to talk about but um i do think it's really interesting because it 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 actually proposes saxon some things that could maybe actually fix stuff like Like what i really i really like this bill i think it's actually really interesting and i don't know how you get something like this through congress but i do think that this is the product it's simple and it's the product of some serious thought and and it does a lot of cool things that are, that are worth talking about okay so headline number one <laughs> there's some reportage that is claiming it creates a minimum of one penny a stream and that's not true <laughs> as far as <laughs> far as i can tell oh did you actually like read the bill <laughs> yeah no i i i sat down i sat down and believe it or not spent all of eight and a half minutes reading the 13 page bill of which the final nine pages are definitions um of things in the bill 
Oh, I love and it when it does that. <laughs> maybe, look, maybe I missed it. I like searched for scent after after I finished reading the bill. I searched for scent. Well, did you and search then for like the, the number one and then the scent? No, sign? I just searched did for scent. That? So I got a lot of oh, percents. Okay, so. I got a lot of percents. But in the interest in journalism, I just nexted my way through those bad boys. I didn't just see the first yeah. percent and give up. No, I kept going. So I don't think that I'm confused about why various music media outlets that shall not be named are just incorrectly reporting the contents of this bill. Yeah, but that's not what's in here. I actually came to this... I just want to emphasize that it's not a fraction of a penny, and it'll at least be one full penny or more. Well, no, that's what the folks were claiming. But we don't know if that's true I don't true know either. if that's yeah. true. <laughs> we don't know if that's true. Well, I, I mean, I, un, actually totally unclear, yeah, unclear if it would re- produce that, but... It's certainly not in the bill that it would. And I actually came to this bill being like, oh, it's going to be the penny thing. And that I don't think makes all that much sense. I mean, it'd be cool, but I I don't. And then it wasn't there. And I was like, oh, this is an entirely (laughs) different bill than the stories I read about them. So, okay, here's the big takeaways. This bill is really interesting because in some ways it's not targeted at the music industry. The one penny a stream proposals right we're like the companies have to pay out a penny a stream and then we went in and the reason we didn't like those bills or thought not that we didn't like them but we thought that they didn't quite actually make (laughs) dollars and cents sense is that they require companies like spotify that are actually like not they they make on money the by selling stock and by website, stock, but it has like, like a royalties calculator, a and in the royalties calculator, as far as we could tell, and are being it, that basically any blood that goes into them is being estimating out that you're going to make at least Universal a penny music, um, among, on your among each others. per stream. And so a penny and a stream, then it's adding in this you have to pay out more the percentage which Sam is talking about, which would be fifteen to fifty percent of the money. This is different. So made off of what they are doing is in this bill. Raising the price of every music subscription f- service by fifty percent. <laughs> this is the this is taking this is the that fifty percent, and then fifty percent, which should be not less than four and not more than ten dollars. Taking that extra cash that is being now taken f- at, taken from consumers, and then creating a month new monthly bucket that is paid directly to artists on uh, a maybe one of the reasons why how much it's been do a little bit each, confusing how many streams do is, each of you get ratio which is a really different way to approach dealing with the music industry a it's bypassing the labels which is crazy right that's not money that's going through the labels that's money that, that the government is now taking collecting from consumers and then paying out to artists which is directly transformative i mean i guess to a certain extent they're like this is a little bit more like what happens with the you know radio for songwriters or or performances with ascap that there's this like non you know music industry but non record label organization that does this in this semi-governmental way and they're creating with you know with the library of congress creating their own I got, you know, <laughs> good luck with whoever has to organize that data uh, <laughs> and try to make it work. So it, it totally bypasses the record industry and creates this like alternate path that, again, with a bucket of money that it does by just being like all the consumers, you have to pay more now, which like remonetizes music by fiat, which is wild, wild. I'll just mention as a little caveat here that if you you should and we'll link to this, but you should all go to the UMAW website because they're actually looking for signatures, both from musicians and non-musicians. And I will say they do probably, they they have a goal, I think of 25,000 signatures, I believe it looks like from, uh, from actual musicians. And they they still have uh, quite a bit to go about, about 12, 12, a little over 12,000. So I suggest you go and we'll definitely link to it, but I will just say that there is a, um, a uh, like a sort of uh, royalty calculator which is trying to estimate like how much you would make off of depending on the streams and and as far as we are saying and this goes into what sam was saying that actually um the calculator seems to be sort of like a rough estimate and it's not necessarily accurate to what is in the actual bill but nonetheless all of our points pretty much 
remain the same. Just don't take that calculator it's as a little, like fact. It's a little, it's confusing, a little confusing and might yeah. be tied to a previous, you <laughs> yeah. know, that previous push for a, a cent of street. Right, yeah. There was a previous again, push like, in like 2022 by Talib as well that like was also, yeah, um, uh, trying to get musicians and artists paid better for streaming royalties. Well, and, and I think that this is a, the tricky thing about this bill and that I, I, I think I'm really interested in it which is that just to be very clear like the narrative of these record industry the record industry the major labels man they're stealing our money <laughs> they're 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 profiting from the the artists is a really effective one in the public imagination and that the penny a stream campaign which like some of the, the calculations on the uh, um the Yuma website and some other you know some of the media coverage around this is um is as i think still calls on on like the, the narrative clarity of that campaign um and it's a really effective one right like who doesn't want to support artists against the evil major labels yeah this bill it's very important to say doesn't well it takes 10 percent of non-streaming income from the from the streaming co companies and, and throws it to artists, which is actually really interesting and is given how all of this <laughs> works. Like that's kind of a big hit, especially to the potential for non-subscription models, right? Which are being run in advertising and therefore aren't streaming royalty, like right, aren't, right. aren't um, streaming subscription money. But let's be very clear. This is not being paid out from the record companies. This is coming out of consumers pockets, which I actually, which I think is a good thing. I think that people underpay for music. I think music is too cheap. I think that in the past, like, and, and certainly in my memory as a, you know, music buyer, I used to spend more money on new records because I had to purchase them. And so there's a real argument that, you know, in a capitalist economy, money talks and everything else walks and that making that the fact that various tech companies have systematically undervalued music and used it as a loss leader we've talked about this a lot has been really bad for music as an ecosystem um because it makes it gives it less weight in the world um or less obvious weight but i do think that there's going to be it's a tough sell to say your spotify subscription is now 16 dollars a month from 11 and that's what this bill does. And that five bucks is going directly to artists, which again, like I support and want to be very clear. I think that this should happen, but it is, it's a, it's a, it's a trickier, it's a trickier political thing to nail. And you can see already how various industry attacks are going to come at bills like this, especially given the fact that this money is not being distributed through record companies, which all of a sudden breaks a huge structure of dependency that exists between record companies and artists well it, it did make me think that maybe that's part of the reason when you were explaining it like why the bill was like shaped that way because like maybe you know if you're not taking money away from the dsp and you're not taking money away from direct directly i should say from like the record label although one could say if the consumer is paying more then that's more potential money for the dsp and the record labels to earn but because the money isn't coming directly out of their coffers pockets whatever then maybe they thought that this would be like a way in which you could bring this forth in front of congress and you're like less likely to step on the toes of like the major lobbyists for both of these industries but i don't know no, that's, that's a good, maybe a stretch a, you know i don't know no no no. i think that's a good point because I, so one thing i think about a lot um in this kind of system is is what we learned when we did that episode about a couple episodes about Ticketmaster, right where one of the things that Ticketmaster gets paid for is being the bad guy. Mm -hmm. Like, right. some of the fees, some of the, like, the, the quote-unquote, like, bullshit Ticketmaster fees are actually being given to the artists, are given to the venues, are given to all types of folks who need the income or need the, you know, their palms greased in various ways to make this industry work. And part of Ticketmaster's value proposition is they'll hate us. Right. And we're happy to have them hate us. And then you don't have to be hated and i do think that clearly there's you know subscription fees are inching up but you could imagine this opening a conversation where it's not us it's the government and it's a bipartisan bill and it's for the musicians and it's not us and that the, it, that something like this could give cover now 
you might also imagine a world like you were saying, and this gets complicated business thing, where if they had a choice, if you're either Spotify or let's say Universal Music, and you had a choice of do you want in some ways your piece of the pie to be 11 bucks and then this government piece of the pie is 550 that you don't really deal with or if that's a doable proposition oh wow we could have been charging 16 bucks this whole time and maybe paid out more to artists but like had a bigger pie by by 50 percent that's a that's you're a saying they were pie. charging 16 and then this gets passed and it has to up it up to like 20 and you're like, well, that's a, that, yeah, that's, that's almost like a doubling. What if you pay like nine now, nine, 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 10, 11, it's, it's 11 now, 11 Went from now. Nine, so nine, yeah, nine well, that's, I don't know. Just like, do like 20, another, with inflation, an extra 25%. With inflation it's like, yeah. it's like eight from when they first started. <laughs> yeah. 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 Interesting. Yeah. But at the same time, like that remonetization might be the way to do it. It's just like stuff happened semi-organically that made music in America worth less within the system that it could be used partially because the way that music, you know, the enforcement mechanisms for monetizing music fell apart, like kind of famously, um, basic, which the enforcement mechanism being you had to buy it <laughs> and see the, in physical right. form. And so we've talked a lot about like, what does it mean to remonetize and how could you remonetize? And we've talked about the idea of like sectoral remonetization, like that these huge, you know, a huge chunk of YouTube's value is based on music, but it doesn't look that way because it's kind of like ancillary. It's like the the et, you know the the videos about Napoleon's campaign in Jenna has more value because you can also watch Shakira next, like <laughs> and, and having the entire catalog, having on your website the entire catalog of recorded human music, basically. Plus all the other stuff it makes all the other stuff more valuable in a way that can be hard to capture the value of. So we've talked before about the potential for like whether you need some sort of sectoral, maybe even governmental structure to like move that value around in ways that allow music to keep functioning, that allows you to water that musical ecosystem so that so that you can so that musicians can keep making music or else they'll go away. And but once you've killed the music scene because no one can make money doing it, like it's not that easy to get back. Music scenes need to be healthy. Musical and cultural ecosystems need to be healthy. And so part of me is like, yeah, like fiat, this is kind of cr- the, the imagination behind this where you're like, oh, the government can just do a big thing like this that just, oh, the all music is worth, right? The government can make music worth 50% more this mo- <laughs> this month is is a is real imagination and it's, it's fascinating yeah no i like that i think that's a really good point and uh i think that that's something that maybe we need a little bit more of <laughs> just generally in the world that like hey you know the government could just do like big shit that like makes a, actually makes a huge difference in in people's lives yeah so i mean there's a couple other little pieces so in addition to that like that big sweeping idea and the way which I can't, i'm you know struggling to think through like the full implications of giving musicians an entirely non-record label structure for payouts, which really cuts to the core of the power of the labels in, in all kinds of ways. Like, it's like I love it. It's wild. It's I don't think it's going to pass, but it opens up so many interesting conversations in so many different directions. And one of those is there's a couple other pieces of like little bits and pieces in this bill that, again, reveal that like, world reshaping imagination so one of them is the 10 percent of all non-subscription money which is interesting because a that slush fund is kind of important for all kinds of people in the industry um but b uh if you go back to our conversation with uh, meredith rose about streaming in the dark the only way to do that to get that number would be to audit and all of a sudden all like just the implications, which I'm sure everyone is like, ha, 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 no, you're never getting that number because like <laughs> that number tells you a lot like that 10% might be a lot bigger than people think or might, you know, it's who knows exactly how these things work or much smaller, right? Like if uh, advertising is, as some people have suggested, like not functional for certain kinds of like music streaming services but but there and then a couple other places in the bill there's just kind of 
you know, and obviously we'll have to like double check the money, <laughs> which is totally fair, but like also not something the record industry has literally ever been interested in substantively since 1890, if um, not earlier. Like I, <laughs> I've found like newspaper articles of songwriters complaining about crooked books in sheet music publishing. Like it's, it's always been thus. Um, and so yeah, having that kind of government oversight into this industry that's really thrived on opacity is it would be really exciting. And like again, the, the takeaway from that Rose interview, which is that their fundamental questions about the political economy of music, like are musicians making more money now than they did previously? Um, which like the answer seems like it's no, and certainly a lot of folks think it's no, but also literally we don't have the facts. And so is it a different set of artists making – like, we don't know in this fundamental way. And it's very hard to understand what the implications of any kind of bill or any kind of legislation would have on the musical ecosystem when these basic facts are just so ho- hidden behind so many layers of NDAs and secrecy. And so that's one big implication. Another – and this is my favorite, Saxon. This is by far my favorite part of this bill, which <laughs> I am nerding out on, clearly – is that in the calculations of streams, it's whatever is lower. Like in terms of, you know, figuring out your percentage of this additional money pot, it's whichever is lower of however many streams you get a month or a million. Which (laughs) Right, yeah, I love that aspect of it, yeah. (laughs) Right, so, so just like, which means that for this payout bucket, which given how much money people make from streaming services is i think is going to be more than they currently make from streaming services i think that's certainly that's what the calculator suggests but i think that that's likely to be more i don't think that 50 percent is a big chunk to be paid directly to artists bypassing you know keeping the lights on um all kinds of other stuff capping that payout at a million dollars sorry a million streams a month is a is a is a wild like is a totally different way to run a music economy like and i think that that so that means that if and you know if you have uh let's let's take a, a classic one hit wonder song like just like thinking about the, the the ways that this kind of change in the payout structures would start reshaping the music industry say classic song my personal go to one hit wonder is a uh, blue by eiffel 65 which i imagine when became a global hit, generated an inc- it was pre streaming, but let's say Eiffel sixty five happened, you know, blue happened now, would generate a huge number of streams really quickly and then trail off. And that one hit wonder, a huge chunk of it would be in stuff that's over a million streams a month, right? If you have something that goes, you know, streaming style platinum for a year and then falls away forever, like it's really pushing back against those people like a a music economy where those have always made similar amounts of money this is actually pushing towards it's better to have a lower slower simmer of a whole bunch of streams constantly rather than being a one-hit wonder in this really interesting way why why do you think it is that though because if you're looking at the language it does say it says like you know it's 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 about qualifying streams it says the lesser of and this is a either the number of streams of the master recording accrued by an artist or B, one million streams. Like, I, I like. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that that's like the? Because they don't want all of this to go to Beyonce. They're doing it by percentage and big folks. This actually imagine dragons. Let's be real. They're getting more streams. Yeah, yeah no, it's imagine. It's imagine. No, no, a million streams per song per month. It's per song per month, right? Yeah, per month. Yeah, yeah. And at a calendar month. Yeah, 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 per track per month. It, but that's the like thing. Like a master I, recording, rather, at a calendar month. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's the thing. I actually think what's really interesting about that million stream a month is like, is it doesn't... Imagine Dragons is a perfect example of someone it's not going to kill, <laughs> actually. Um, because right, anyone okay. who's huge and has a long tail, right? They release a new album and it gets... No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> right, like... 
like what's interesting about this, I think, is the way it, it, Imagine Dragons is a perfect example to think through, not just because we've just spent a lot of time thinking and listening to Imagine Dragons, <laughs> but you, you, you could imagine, <laughs> um, you could, you, you'd imagine, right, that the way, if this was became, if this was passed and it became a primary payout mechanism for the industry, think about how it would match onto a, a major Imagine Dragons album. The album drops, the two or three hit singles generate way more for the first couple of months, more than a million streams a month. All of that is cut off, right? A song can generate 15 million streams. A million streams is not that many streams for a hit song at all. This is like really like mom and pop musicians. Like, yeah, at, no. like a million yeah. is like a moderate hit. So for the major payout of the system, anything that is over a, like a moderate hit, all those extra streams don't count. But now it's a year after and many of the, you know, then the big hits, I mean, I don't know if they get, they probably even get more than that, but like they'll get a million streams forever some of these a million streams a month or close to it for a really long time at least a million yeah 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 so like I, but but anything over a million doesn't count they'll clock in at, considering this bill is a, they would clock in the, they would clock the million like every single month basically for a long time yeah years right yeah. for a really long time so it actually in this funny way like pushes toward this pot of money pushes it towards folks with longer catalogs folks that are racking up more you know a re like the best person to do is to have like 15 songs that are always clocking a million streams not have had a career where you had a couple of big hits and then not as many unfortunately at some level that actually just means that this is rolling stones bait once again like the band that is best situated to to tr like profit off of this and disproportionately get wins is a classic rock band with a ton of hits that like all get around a million streams a month but doesn't have anything new well because i would actually i would actually push i would actually push back against the kind of things you're saying and maybe this is where my math brain comes in which is not my strong point <laughs> but like if you're a one hit if you're a one hit one yeah if you're like a one hit wonder and like with like uh, like a, a quick hit and then it dies off like a month and a half two months later then in, potentially like you could have without this cap within two months earn whatever royalties are giving you like for let's say 300 million plays in two and a half months before like it really drops off but instead because you're only a one hit wonder you're only getting paid out for like two and a half million streams and then it's like a much lesser yeah. number so like you never get back like that you're never going to get back like that 298 million streams which you could have right. gotten so I see it, do, it does benefit like legacy artists more. So yeah. that is what you're saying. And it actually, it doesn't really work against, but you're saying that for like the, mu the, the musical ecosystem, that actually might be like a good thing because so, I mean, it will try to be like a sense that like you are just looking for one hit wonders and make a lot of money and you're trying to have more sustainable art careers. But doesn't that kind of like, I don't know, how do you like, you can't, you know, that's more of an ephemeral sort of thing anyways. Like nobody has like a, well, you know, the KL, the KLF has a strict formula for a one hit wonder, but you know, most of the time we can't really say there's like a formula to it as much as people try to like. No, no, no. I think out. that that's right. So I think that the, one of the things that, I mean, and it's important to note that in this, the utopian future where this bill is passed, everyone's making more money because this is on top of the existing payout. So that one hit wonder is still making whatever this is more like a fairness it's not like it's not like i'm like i'm like helping out the one hit wonder or like the random indie rock band that gets on the right playlist into the right movie and suddenly gets like a you know one month of like 150 million streams or something like that it's actually like it's just more just of a fairer model well so no here's the here's what i guess what i'm saying for a long for a long term more sustainable future sorry so th yeah. this is what i'm saying right clearly any version in which there's 50 percent more music in the e 50% more money in the music ecosystem and that's being given yeah. to artists they will make more money so it's possible even in the the capped version of that one hit wonder like they'll get some real money but compared to you want to be the Baha men right is who you at some level you want to be and that everyone had to buy the CD <laughs> right, um, and, right. you, and the you know 
one hit wonders in the streaming e- ecosystem you can have 200 million streams and it's still not like it's not mansion money so and i don't even know like if would 2.5 million streams be better you know we don't have the calculations for that that's it but what i guess what i'm saying is is clearly the music industry is organized around money and so more profitable pathways people end up doing that right so whenever there's a new structural force that pushes people in one direction or another that makes certain kinds of careers more or less profitable the rest of the ecosystem evolves around that so rap songs that are really short like streaming era rap songs so you can have a whole bunch of them or really long albums so that people just throw on scorpion and listen to you know two point nine hours of Drake All or whatever thirty eight tracks um, yeah. or you know <laughs> right the, so it, it, as examples of like how these kinds of payout structures end up shaping stuff and what's interesting about this payout structure is the way is like trying to think what what I'm interested in is trying to think through who it helps who it hurts and how people would try to profit from it Exploit right it. yeah find love um and so it, yeah. one of this is you know like. You could imagine big stars. This really doesn't work well for the beyond the current Beyonce model, where it's r- rare drops of music. Actually, this is like if you're a, a superstar, what you want is as many tracks as possible hitting a million streams a month, um, because anything over that is kind of wasted revenue. And in, in fact, it's probably better to have a whole bunch of different ones <laughs> because it doesn't say how many streams you can have, like tracks you can have. And if you just, just take the same set of listens and distribute it over more tracks, then you get more money. Similarly, I was saying that it, it's interesting that it does kind of push towards, and you can imagine band, maybe a million streams is a lot, but you can imagine kind of like long tail medium successful americana artists doing really well under this you know they occasionally have a jason isabel i'm not saying a big you know or country like mid mid tier country folks right where they're like doing a lot of songs that have around a million streams and if you know careers where it's less you have to be the young hot thing and then it moves on things where it's like it's album seven and you're still selling a decent number you know you still have a decent number of streams in some ways, this those people would be, a, a, I think, at an advantage from this kind of thing. And then you'd imagine music in, a music industry where if this is the model, you could imagine um, a music industry where um, that really pushes people towards that model. It's important to note, however, that just because the monies are initially paid out to a musician doesn't mean it stays with that musician. And anything can be dealt with <laughs> in contract negotiations. So you could imagine a thing where... You know, actually you need, and this maybe spins out, but this is like what we know about how the system works. You actually need a sustainable career. If the goal is to have 15 songs that get played a million times a month, you actually need a lot of like long-term A&R label support to do that. And then maybe the music industry starts being like, yeah, we can give you that support in order to get you that point. But like 20%, yeah, 20%, baby, 20% of this money coming in. But I also think that in thinking through this model, like it also doesn't take away what we talked about in a more recent episode, which is that like you can like make a living off like a one hit wonder, essentially, even if you're even if it's capping at a million streams and then you're getting this extra percentage, like you're still making yeah. a living. It's not like, yeah, yeah, no, no, it's true. And and that it could you could just have a song that like ca- keeps that. If it's a, I mean, I guess or it goes away and it comes thing. back or whatever. Yeah. But like, yeah, it de- I guess it depends on the kind of one hit wonder. Yeah. And which sure. also changes the music industry, right? Like there's yeah. a lot of people who like, you know, the, the classic, um, I'm trying to think of a good example of, um, you know, like, uh, uh, XTC, right. Where it's like, they've got senses working overtime, which is probably their biggest hit. And like, maybe, you know, or, uh, that, you know, there are a million other bands like this where like they had a career they have got one hit that actually broke through for whatever reason but they are still able to tour and build on off that and yeah no it would and it would kind of support those and if it's a good song that you know the one hit wonders that people want to listen to all the time and not the one hit wonders where it's like no offense to the baja men but like <laughs> who let the dog out dogs out dance floor banger but it, it doesn't have you know the full staying appeal of of, of some, not 
I take that back. Who let I, I, I love who let the dogs out. That's an incredible song. I've got nothing bad to say about it. Here I am trying to trying to trying to lie in order to make my point. But you know what? I can't. I can't do it. Baja men forever. Yeah, I mean, like making new generations of toddlers enjoy the genius of pop music. Like still, like uh. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 numerous times I've noticed children uh, hearing that song that are like under the age of five and then enjoying It's the it. woofing. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like, the woofing. You get to woof. Bahamut and David it's like, Byrne, it's you that, know, that like, sweet like spot music between... for, for toddlers becoming adults. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, I think we're going to transition to our second topic. <laughs> So like we we gonna slide into the to another topic. Slide which into the DMs headlines. of the mayor. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, which actually like you know you want to talk about the government doing big things, and uh, our mayor uh, always you know, doing too much. And talk about uh, o- opacity and opaqueness of of uh, <laughs> certain companies. The United States is 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 gonna get rid of TikTok, boys and girls. 170 million users, nearly half of the country. It's trying to it's trying to get rid of it. I mean, recently, as you might have been reading, the uh, the uh, the House passed a bill that would uh, force uh, basically force a sale or a divestment, if I'm understanding yeah. correctly, of ByteDance, which is the Chinese company that owns runs TikTok. And it would give it like something like I I don't know I, I read it's through like a lot six of this. months I, and I, okay. <laughs> yeah it's like six six months or something or like 168 days I don't know which I don't number. know which of these pieces of legislation is less realistic to be honest like get like t- take our culture with the seriousness yeah. it deserves come on folks six months is yeah, not uh, put, it's not good <laughs> yeah put forth by obviously a uh, paranoid Republican from I believe the state of Minnesota who uh, will not be running for a re-election but wants to go out with a bang by uh, supposedly uh, banning banning TikTok. Uh, Mike Gallagher is his name if you're curious and he says uh, that uh, the U.S. could not take the risk of having a dominant news platform in America controlled or owned by a company that is beholden to the Chinese Communist Party news platform in america that's a that's a pretty that's a pretty intense i mean especially uh, intense uh, description of TikTok, especially but. given the fact that um rupert rupee m mr murdoch is not is australian that's a that's a foreign country i just want to be clear about that australia no 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 shade to our australian listeners or australian friends but it is not a part of the u.s as I'm sure you'll agree. And so it is, it's always interesting. They drive on the other side of the road. <laughs> it's like, it's always interesting. And, 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 uh, uh, and I actually don't know where News Corp is based, like corporately, but like we know who it's owned by. And like, it's always interesting, like which foreign, which countries does it bother you when the news is owned by? And which company, which countries are you fine with it? It's like Australian, just for some strange reason, the Republicans are more okay <laughs> with. <laughs> and I mean, yeah, well, weird well, I mean, how that you is. Could extend, you could actually expand that, and you can you could also expand that. I mean, like, let's be real; like, the ironies are endless here, and we're going to try to focus a little bit on like what it means, I guess, for the music industry. But like, uh, you know, the ironies are endless here because you could also expand that to say, depending on like what social media platform you care about, because simultaneously right now, there are laws attempting to be passed in the state of Texas and Florida, surprise, surprise, and a pushback against about against the censorship of certain posts and quote unquote news agencies on Facebook from uh, offering and amplifying misinformation and disinformation on public health, vaccines, election fraud. So now the Republicans on the side are pushing against that. But if you're Chinese owned and your name is not Mark Zuckerberg, then we need to get rid of you and get you out of the US. So, so. I, I actually think that they should sell TikTok to RTE. 
Um, <laughs> I think that I think that a, a version in which it's our Irish cultural overlords. Um, I just think it would it would look the amount of banter and taking the shit on the platform would dramatically rise. I just yeah I think sell TikTok to RTE, um, and like you know it's a Gabby platform and and give it to the, the you know. It might, it might, it might, it might bankrupt the Irish government, but uh, <laughs> it's happened because before. that's also the problem, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so so what's going on? So what's going on? So uh, like, let, let's 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 jump into it. So then, on um, top of this, there's a, on top yes, of on top all of this, this, and and what what really piqued our attention about this initially um, was not just as the U.S. Congress thinking about forcing a divestment of TikTok, but our proud mayor is suing TikTok and Instagram. Proud mayor of New York. Yeah, sorry, proud mayor of New York. All of all of our proud mayor. I mean, look, he's, I don't live in New York anymore. He, he's <laughs> he's America's mayor, and the world is you know America's the shining city on the hill for the entire world, which I believe by the transit of property makes Eric Adams the world's mayor. Look, I'm not a logician, but I'm pretty sure that's correct. You didn't vote for him, <laughs> but him and his belief in power crystals and his inability to fight rats successfully. Is your problem as well? Um, and his laptop currently being uh, looked through by uh, federal agents, and his ties to <laughs> Turkish businessmen, and his... yeah, the list, and uh, shady, shady clubs in Brooklyn, and uh, Queens, yeah, and the Bronx. Yeah. And... <laughs> anyway, um, is is su- basically su- suing um, TikTok and Instagram for basically saying that they've the city, and this is interesting because it's true. I think probably. That the city has had to spend hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars on teen mental health and that they think that TikTok and Instagram are not just bad for teen mental health, that they think the companies know that and that they're pushing, you know, creating addictive apps that suck teens in and that the city of New York is having to pay to try to ameliorate this problem and in kind of a... N- cigarette company-esque model saying like if you create an addictive thing that we have to spend hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars to try to fix like you we should get part of your profits to do that and this is uh this is kind of echoing i think also something we saw in new york a couple years back with uh, bloomberg trying to ban large sodas (laughs) yeah how dare he um prevent my constitutional right to drink 44 ounces of uh high fructose corn syrup <laughs> straight, <laughs> straight. <laughs> so i do so that's kind of the general background and so i think we thought we would we would talk about tiktok and clearly to kind of tiktok generally because kind of in some ways building off of the la the, the first half of the episode or first part of the episode um thinking about our ability to conceptualize large-scale change and the ability to potentially do something about it. Um, clearly, TikTok has become incredibly important to the music industry. This is not a strictly musical conversation, but I, I mean, honestly, the version where TikTok roars in totally reshapes the music industry, and then it's just banned is really funny. And so, in the kind of the the nihilistic version of everything, I, it's like that's the funniest outcome, <laughs> just because like. It just like totally, <laughs> no one will know what to do, and so part of me is like, "What happens if that happens?" But, but I mean, I do think that while much like the previous bill, I don't. I think it's very easy to say we're going to make TikTok illegal, and much more difficult to do it in like legal ways. Um, so I don't think this is going to happen, but I do think it, it gives us insight into the the an increased imagination of possibility and an increased potential to to both think about how our society is being shaped and potentially do something about it. And then certainly it would fundamentally reshape the music industry in all kinds of ways. So I was just saying, so, so a little bit away from our, our, our traditional stomping grounds, but clearly deeply related. Yeah. I think just, just to clarify some of the points that you just said that, yeah, basically, I mean, it'd be really, first of all, like, yeah, it, it technically wouldn't be completely banned. The, the, the legislation that has to now face uh, the Senate, it means that like, as I mentioned earlier, that bite dance was somehow within 165 days have to divest from TikTok, which is also one of those things where it's like, how can you even fucking prove that? Um, TikTok also now is estimated to be worth around 50 billion. So like finding, I supposedly an American, or as you mentioned, perhaps an Australian company that wants to go ahead and uh, 
and and buy up TikTok would be difficult. Not to mention well, the, the legal, I mean, the, the weird like geopolitical ramifications that this might this might cause. Not to mention also that Donald Trump in 2020, it should be mentioned, did kind of push forth uh, this this, this uh, a similar attempt at banning TikTok and was essentially that um, federal courts basically like like knocked it down saying that there wasn't first of all there wasn't enough evidence that it was a security threat to the united states and also there was a lot of concerns about the first amendment violations as well so that's kind of like a background of like probably like why it would be difficult to happen anyways but hey i mean like it also should be mentioned that and i didn't know this as well but it also should be mentioned that actually something similar did happen in regards to uh grinder which was uh forced to be sold as well which was interesting. And I actually did not know that. Did you know? I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, it turns out that uh, during the Trump administration, the government forced uh, a Chinese company to sell the dating app Grindr uh, because there was concerns that the app, uh, which uh, would... Could, without Republicans. Yeah, without Republicans, exactly. <laughs> yeah, let's be real. Without Republicans, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, and uh, yeah, cause un- ir- ir- live ir- one way and love another to their to their to their alpha families. No, it would, could expose sensitive information about Americans to China, which is like the same weird China phobia concern that is around like TikTok. Um, so I mean, it has happened, so it could happen. But I mean, I think that this is probably not only facing an uphill battle in Senate, but also probably more un- pretty unlikely to happen. But as you mentioned, there are a lot of interesting uh, aspects to this attempt. And this idea, at least, that we can we can at least uh, spend the next like 10, 15 minutes uh, thinking on. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I wanted to start. But yeah, what you're saying about previous divestments and like crazy stuff has happened. Right. Bell got split up. That happened. Right. Right. Like big corporate changes can be made by government. I mean, kind of responding to your point about it with 50 billion. And there's some nice reporting from um, a recent episode of On the Media about this, actually. Um, that pointing out like which companies can buy, can afford to pay $50 billion and they're fang, right? For the most part. Yeah. Um, all of which are in deep competition with, and have been unable to answer TikTok's challenge in many ways. Right. Facebook is trying with Instagram. Um, YouTube has shorts. That's Google. Um, I mean, Apple has never really had a social media presence, but has the cash to do it probably. Has a huge stockpile of cash. A forced sale, which would also necessarily be like probably for a lower price than it would be otherwise, would there are only a couple people who could pick up the check. And clearly having a smaller just US based company makes it less competitive. So it's it's complicated. But I do think that it's worth maybe thinking about what makes tiktok different than other tech platforms or what makes tiktok similar and what makes tiktok similar than other media platforms that have existed because because i think that like taking seriously the worry which i i do think is both at one level geopolitical and another level racist i think putting it like i think that there's you can it is it is possible to both be concerned about the rise of a relatively authoritarian china <laughs> And not be racist against yeah, completely. anything yeah. that has to do with China and the way that this is being discussed. I think it's important to say is like it's clearly racially inflected. And like for anyone who who's really engaged with like the long history of like the quote unquote yellow peril is like this echoes stuff from 1900. This echoes stuff from earlier. It's like it's clearly racially inflected in in the in the type of panic. and it's in, and I think it's racially inflected in the type of panic because of the fact that like if they really were so concerned about like the leaking of information or the gathering of information, then like they would look within their own borders at like the way that like information is leaked to and collected and harvested for money or whatever and, and resold to whoever private anybody between like, you know, Google or Meta Alphabet, all of these companies. I mean, you know, read Shoshana Zuboff's like, you know, uh, uh, surveillance surveillance capitalism, capitalism, you know, as, 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 as the, as the latest sort of, tome to uh to to learn about that kind of thing so yeah and so that just exposes the sort of irony of this and the racial like component of this that it's really just this chinese asian phobia for sure no but but that's a really good point and and i think it kind of um that that's a a much less (laughs) like abstract way of of 
saying what what I was what I was just trying to say, um, which is that I think that it's interesting to think about what TikTok is and how it functions as a media source. And how it maybe differs, the kind of information that it has kind of differs from the kinds of information that other social media platforms have maybe. And the way that it functions. Um, Because I think it's it's true. And again, I've I've heard reporting about this um, that kind of points out, well, Facebook has your information and sells it too. And it's not like, and like Russia bought facebook information in rubles in 2016 it's not like a u.s company having that information somehow makes it fort knox you know but but i do think that there's something interesting because tiktok facebook to a certain extent but facebook has a, 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 a less algorithmically inflected cultural vision i think clearly the bubbles and clearly the rage like the i think that there's been a lot of investigation and reportage about like did russian attempts actually yeah. changed the election in 2016 and i think it's really inconclusive and we may never know it does seem that like shaping the facebook algorithms to prioritize posts which we know that they did that prioritize posts that created certain kinds of enge- like engagement and specifically like certain levels of time of engagement shaped the emotional tenor in in various ways of that election and of american discourse so we've seen discourse be changed by social media platforms, but I, in some ways, I do think that that was a like a a blunt universal hammer of a change in compared to what TikTok does really, really well is feed you things that you're interested in, and it does seem, especially we've seen in the music industry, where they can make they can quote unquote heat songs that are blowing up. Like it's possible to shape conversations and discourses by if only given the the increased level of machine learning and ai in recent years where you can have it totally doable now to to every video immediately gets a like fairly detailed subject matter description that clusters next to other subject matters and you could put your hands on the scale for certain kind of subject matters versus other kind of subject matters that like would be relatively not easy to do but like like not just totally doable it's doable like full full stop and so i do think that social media platforms where it's giving people tremendous amounts of information things like tiktok is so i think that 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 quote you read where it's like tiktok as a media platform is a really because it's more broadcasty because it's less conversational because it does function as a conversation shaping system in a different way which makes me think about the longer history um, American media platforms, right? That we don't tend to like to admit this, but clearly over the 20th century, and there's all kinds of critiques of this, right? From like Guy Debord on of like that these big media platforms fundamentally shape our reality and that they need to be understood as non-elected semi-governmental entities that that shape reality and that are an integral part of modern consumer capitalism for and modern consumer demo- modern consumer democracy, which are like you know go hand in hand, and they're part of a functioning system, and that you know we don't have full control over that exists as another part of the power structure of our nation. And from that perspective, I mean, it is interesting, right? The the like Hearst at the turn of the 20th century and other big media firms that clearly exerted massive amounts of power, but were integrated into the American power structure in different ways than a company that's more firmly based overseas. And so thinking through what kind of role does something like TikTok play? What kind of role does it play in an evolving social system in which some of those older power centers have been more disrupted, right? Hollywood was this for a really long time, and clearly Hollywood doesn't have the ability to create normative visions of the world in the same way that it once did. Um, Or certainly like normative American-centric visions of the world in the way it once did, certainly given the the fact that the global box office is more important than the domestic box office at this point. And so I do think that there's this like, it seems like this is a conversation in this kind of complicated way about social engineering in a, in a way that I think can make 
people kind of nervous, um, perhaps. And, and to me, it reminds me a lot of like these questions about the, the kinds of conversations that happened a lot in the early 20th century, where all of a sudden there are these industrial corporations that no one really saw coming at this scale and were clearly like integral to the way America was functioning at at a, at a business level, but also at a social level that they were organizing American society. And there was, there were these conversations about like, holy shit, <laughs> holy shit. There are these corporations and they, they're acting differently and have an ability to shape American society. Unlike anything we've ever seen before. And the corporations are kind of freaked out by how much power they have, though they like it. The politicians are freaked out by how much power they have. And there's this conversation about like, okay, what do we want our society to look like? And I think that over the course of the 20th century, and certainly in the 21st, we've lost that up ability to like have those kinds of conversations. It's, you know, some of this is neoliberalism, the idea that it's all just individuals and will kind of work itself out. But like TikTok is not an individual problem. TikTok is a social collective question. And trying to say like, what do, what do we, we're going to have algorithmically designed social media platforms that shape people's lives and how they think and how their reality functions. What do we want them to look like? And, and yeah. I keep thinking not to go back to the early 19th, late, late 19th, early 20th century again, but there's this moment with like Teddy Roosevelt where he's like, maybe the president gets to sit, give every corporation's charter is going to be reviewed annually by the president and any corporation that doesn't do what the president wants, like you can break out, break up. Like clearly that didn't come to pass, but like that that's where we're at right now. It's like, what are these new forms of social organization? What are they gonna how what how do we interact with them as a society? And 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 what how does anything that we do to them then start to shape what our society is gonna look like going forward? But I mean, don't you think that I mean just in regards to like TikTok, like that's not something that actually like is gonna like we're already seeing that. Like regardless of like TikTok exists and it like in the United States or not, like that sort of social question in which like you're putting forth like what about that is like specific to tiktok i think that TikTok, what we're seeing with tiktok be, because i think it can be a political target because of anti-chinese animus i think it's open to space mm. for these kinds of conversations because b- banning facebook isn't imaginable people pull facebook in and yell at them but like i think that somehow because of tiktok's incredibly rapid rise because of its it's dis, it's disproportionate popularity among young people because that it's more explicitly algorithmic in a way that people can get a feel of facebook doesn't feel and twitter and and youtube they feel algorithmic but not in the same way tiktok is so clearly has an algorithmic aesthetic that i think that part is more prominent and even like you know, 75 year old senators are like, Oh yeah, that's, that's a different thing. And I see how it, so I think it, it lets it be an object of like consideration and analysis if, in a different way, maybe. So I think th- that's why, but I don't think there's anything special about TikTok necessarily, but except that, that, that they're having this conversation about it and they're not having this conversation about YouTube as much. I mean, I, well, well. I mean, I, I think that you're bringing up all these like really interesting points that I would like not uh, push back on or disagree with, but I don't think it's actually opening up a space for that, and I don't think that actually it's that is the conversation being had, and I think that actually what's happening is that y- the conversation that is happening is reflective of the society that like these sort of, I guess, just to put a huge umbrella term over it, new technologies and like this sort of new growing ai generated algorithmic ish social media that's like constantly serving us and reinforcing our own biases i think you're seeing these conversations play out in real life about this kind of thing this sort of like what do you mean that like the sort of conversations that are like that are actually being had around if you read you know around like the banning of tiktok is the kind of like paranoia disinformation not actually having a conversation about it, but actually kind of just like screaming into like the void to sort of like reaffirm your own biases. I think it's almost like a byproduct of the sort of like social media, new technology, whatever, what you want to call it, it, the society that that technology is shaping. I I hear that. 
That's a really, that's and a think, really depressing. Yeah. The, it's a classic and and Saxon and, and, depressing take. I love it. I'm here well, for I mean, it. And, and like, I think a, my, my take is like a little bit reinforced by a really interesting piece that was written by Jay Caspian, Caspian, Jay Caspian King in the New Yorker recently. I guess it's like some sort of like new uh, sh- series he's doing in the New Yorker. But he, he does talk about this, you know, kind of building off this idea of like Mal- Malcolm McLuhan's like the medium is the message and kind of like describes like technology as like essentially like an an ideology because it imposes its way of life a set of relations amongst people and ideas about which there has been no consensus i'm quoting now no discussion and no opposition only compliance public consensus has public consciousness has not yet assimilated to the point of the technology is an ideology but the form of that political discourse millions of arguments is actually what makes it impossible to process and follow what should be an evolving and responsive conversation and so it's the idea basically being that like this technology and this 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 new sort of way in which we now engage with our ideas of reality or society or have these conversations is in a strange way a byproduct of what's happening I, in I the hear government. That. I hear that and I think that's a profoundly historically misinformed take. I think that it that it, it it's it's misses how transformative previous technologies and the forms of social and economic organization that accompanied them have been and it misses i I think historical record of yeah there will be sometimes there's a time like there was like arguably 20 years where the railroad companies just ran yeah for sure the united states right and you could have said the same thing about that and then people catch up or something happens in government and some of that right was, you know, if you think about the populist movement and the progressive movement, it's politics, which means it's, and it's American politics, which means it's always like a mixture of paranoid racism, (laughs) frankly, and like visions of how society could be changed and government could be changed. So this this is a kind of part of like maybe this sort of like catching up that like maybe these like, because... Well, let me just put forth one idea and then I'll actually respond to my own idea. But like this idea that like the people in the government are like realizing like just how important now like these platforms are even more so than they did in like 2016 with like whatever the supposed like, you know, the supposed, I mean, they were meddling, but, you know, influence of like Russian meddling on the media. Right, right, right. And then uh, on the flip side of it, somehow like control that. But uh, but I don't know if it feels yeah, I see. I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. It's like there's a sort of realization that these are like powerful platforms, and that's why there's wanting to be this sort of like circle the wagons and make them like uh, amongst a more like conservative, although it is bipartisan, amongst a more conservative sect that like wants to like circle the wagons well, and like I, somehow. Grab well, I mean, I think I think this, it's another, or at least thing. make it like American. We, we, <laughs> no, I, I think that's true, but Plus I racism. also think, and th- this is why, you know. To tr- why I think that this moment is interesting and why the kind of legislation is interesting, right? Because in some ways it's, if you think about how, you know, in, in the kind of long fifth half century of like more or less neoliberal visions of how to run American life, right? It's been pushed on the individual over and over again, right? That, that that's, that's the kind of solutions. That's who has the responsibility. Yeah. Um, that that individual, whether you go to individual tech entrepreneurs, that's the kind of heroes that we have. And even in terms of, you know, there's been really interesting work done on like early Ralph Nader and the vision of like the way to deal with companies is individual personal injury lawsuits and like consumer protection as the primary <laughs> right. thing. And in some ways that's to a certain extent. No, no, it's not. Actually, neither of these lawsuits, and, th- and that's what I think is really interesting about them, and that's why I think that the sense of uh, that there's something different happening here is that neither the New York City lawsuit nor this conversation, this set relatively paranoid conversation about TikTok, say that with enough fixes, with enough guardrails, we can just let you know that the system the system of the market broke a little bit and with a few guardrails we can get it back on track both of them are saying things have changed mm-hmm. fundamentally and we need to make a choice to actively structure our society i think that that this is that 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 you can't it can't just be left up to chance that 
that you and we have to make certain kinds of choices. We either need to let TikTok in or need to not. We need to think about the public health and, and organize around it or not. But that there's no there's no normal. And I think that's the thing I find really interesting, that both of these maybe are a recognition that there is no normal and that in order to make a functional society, we need to make choices about what that society are going to look like. And that, I think, is a really – that's a potentially productive way to think about these technologies that feels very different from the discourse of the last decade plus. I mean, I hear what you're saying. I don't disagree with it. I just don't think that, like, there's something fundamentally – like, I, I just – I, I I see that being directed at TikTok because of this racism, China phobia, yeah. communist phobia, whatever. But I don't see that conversation being directed so much at Meta. I mean, the, New York is suing Instagram. No, I, yeah, well, <laughs> but I mean, I do. I mean, I do. I do see it like a little bit of the concern. I mean, like you know, Zuckerberg had to go in front of like you know Congress and all this stuff and answer questions. But I don't know. I, like they're not trying to ban it because it probably helps the economy. Or, yeah. Or they're not trying to like break it up or whatever. Yeah. I see what you're saying. Okay. Well, like okay. Like I think there's a lot of open-ended questions and like here and like I want to go ahead and just like we'll just kind of like leave them there. But I do want to ask a few questions to wrap up to bring it back to music like. Considering that right now the music of UMG is like not on TikTok, yeah. How do you feel like the majors feel about this, and like how do you think maybe this affects the musical ec- ecosystem? I mean, in the rare case that it actually does get bought out by somebody else, but I, if I just like I, I see you, yeah, raise your eyebrows and interest. But I just want to act like I just think the music industry gets involved and makes their own TikTok. <laughs> or something like that i don't know do they or that's one option i thought of you know but i don't know what's what's your take i mean i think it's a question about that's a really interesting question and i don't know i think that i love that question i love that question thank you for that question saxon what a good <laughs> question um okay so i think that i mean clearly they're starting to play hardball so like right now umg and TikTok are not friends. And so a global company that like doesn't need US copyrights in the same way is a tougher negotiator, maybe. Previously, I would have said that... that uh, yeah, interesting. Previously, yeah. I would have said that given l- fewer business relations, fewer political relations, few, you know, um, cultural capital and nuanced cultural understanding matter. And so I do think that it's been interesting that companies tend to certain kinds of cultural companies, given relative levels of technological equivalence, it seems like local companies tend to win out a lot of times in ways that have surprised me, you know, with local streaming services versus Spotify. And I assume that's because the people in local streaming services, a have the ability to make deals like telecoms that help and b just understand the music market better in a way that makes it a little bit better in a a very tight run race and so i would have said that tiktok should probably play nice with the labels because they really understand u.s music that clearly hasn't happened so maybe they would love a weaker more domestic yeah localized one that they can just domestic that, that they can just sort of own but the thing is, it won't be spun off totally. It will be owned by someone probably. And then it really depends on who and what happens. Because because I do think that the labels have probably done... Having some competition between these various services is probably good for the labels, right? When the, when Apple was the right. only... was When Apple was the town, only... Yeah market in town it, right. game in town it wasn't good for the labels at all you know if it, if it was google that bought it there's no way they're letting google buy tiktok but like if google bought it given how well youtube works with the labels now that might be good but again that's a lot of power i in think the though you could generally company. say though that like lucian grange would like to see a domestic racism or not would probably like to see something yeah. that was like more within the, the borders and the legislation and the laws of like the united states like or like something similar to like, yeah. to have to negotiate with probably and 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 look clearly the music industry likes negotiating with smaller companies they'd rather have it be spotify sized yeah. than yeah. google sized and then as far as like the music yeah as far as the musical ecosystem i mean like i i mean i don't they may take like an initial hit but it just feels like these sort of 
this there's so many musical touch points that are like starting to pop up and there's so many like new ways in which like these sort of fleeting one hit wonder stars that have come out of that which is already starting to die down now like the money that the umg is willing to and company is like willing to like put into these kind of stars is already like they're starting to tighten the purse strings so like i mean i don't i think the effect would probably it, like whatever is the loss would just get transferred over to some other platform yeah yeah, yeah i think that's probably true that's who knows we'll yeah, see like, i don't know who we'll has see. the money but uh yeah we'll see we'll see first it needs to pass the senate and then we'll uh, we'll we'll come back with another episode. Okay, so we went long this time, but um, uh, lots to talk about, lots to think about, and as always, we'll be paying attention. Um, music by Bird Language. Tune in yeah. next time for a track by track analysis of the Imagine Dragons catalog. <laughs> absolutely uh, not, absolutely <laughs> not. Um, please subscribe to our our newsletter, Money for Nothing. That's the number four. Dot Substack. Dot com. We are a lot more active now on the newsletter again. Um, please rate and review us we'd like to see more more five star reviews please and music by bird language and we'll catch you shortly thanks for listening bye